Mogesal mi bitsa kartu politikis institutis sahelit da didi matlo ba gamu chenili interesis. Thank you, George Institute of Politics. Thanks for showing your interest. You know that this event is part of the public discussion series analyzing liberal trend tendencies in Georgia, and the topic for today's discussion is the narratives of far-right nationalists and religious conservatives, and to what extent the narratives match in uh, East and also in West uh, Europe. The series of the public discussions are funded by Open Society Georgia Foundation, we all know that. And uh, within the project, the, the purpose uh, is to uh, identify the factors now standing behind the um, uh, demonstration of um, far radical um, nationalism. Uh, another uh, area that we'll be talking about today is the religious um, uh, conservatism, uh, its developments in uh, Europe and also in Georgia. And we will be talking about the, um, um, the, the matching narratives of far-right nationalists and religious conservatives, uh, because this uh, topic has been the subject of um, a, a lot of discussions um, uh, nowadays. Um, and we will be also uh, covering some of the adjacent areas which uh, we might collect from the uh, questions uh, that we'll be asking as a result of hearing the presentations. Now I would like to present uh, our presenters, two our international presenters. The first international keynote speaker will be uh, uh, Professor Zolt Anyedi, um, Pro-Rector of Hungarian Affairs, Central European University. Uh, he is also the coordinator of Erasmus uh, Department at the university. His research focuses on party politics, comparative government, church and the state relations, and political psychology, especially um, the topics like authoritarianism, prejudices, and political tolerance. So Professor Enyedi will now be discussing some various ways of studying the relationship between religion and nationalism. He will also um, now respond to the question of to what extent and how religious conservatism is linked to the contemporary narrative of the right-wing groups in Western Europe. Second international speaker now is uh, Jacob Schroeder, a researcher at the Lufana University Lüneburg. His research interest includes radical right populism in religion, role of religion in party communication. Mr. Schroeder will uh, deliver a speech about Western European radical and main mainstream right and the reference to religion in and out groups. He will present the key findings of, the, of his paper, questioning whether the, uh, the central right adopt anti-Islam or pro-Christian messages. And the, uh, the local speaker of today's discussion uh, will be Ekaj Itanava, Director of the Tolerance and Diversity Institute, TDI. In Georgia, religion and democracy, as well as minority rights, are among her main research interests. Uh, Ms. Eka Chitanava will provide a broader overview of the relations between the nationalism and religion in Georgia. She will also reflect on how different nationalist narratives are put it and twisted by five right groups in Georgia. So this is briefly about what we are going to discuss today. And now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Uh, Enyedi, Professor Enyedi, and to the audience, uh, one more reminder, you will have the possibility to ask questions. So we have a uh, Q&A function, we also have the chat window, and um, uh, you can now uh, immediately start sending your questions. And now the floor is yours, Professor. Thank you very much. Um, let me start by uh, thanking the organizers for the invitation. <clears throat> And let me say I'm particularly pleased to see some of my uh, best students among the organizers. So I was asked to speak about religion and far-right nationalism. Um, at the beginning, let me remind ourselves that the relationship of nationalism and religion is a very complicated one. Historically, there were uh, periods when political communities such as tribes or city-states had their own god or gods. The worship of these deities practically equaled loyalty to the entire community. This pattern has been recreated in those modern contexts in which 
victorious nationalist movements managed to consolidate a national identity which involved association with a particular religious tradition. But this uh, fusion of religion and nation is not inevitable. In many historical contexts, God and nation present them, themselves as alternatives, alternative targets of loyalty. Most spectacularly, uh, the Catholic Church vehemently opposed the rise of nationalist movements across most of Europe in the 19th century. And it is not difficult to see what may cause the tension between God and nation. Nationalism is partic particularistic by definition, while most of the modern religions have a universalistic message and scope. In order to understand uh, the variation across the globe, one must take into consideration not only the ideological discourse associated with religion and with nationalism, but also the way how nationalists and religious people and their leaders are organized. In case of religion, <clears throat> the structure of the clergy is particularly important. The specificity of the Catholics was that they had one well-defined leader <clears throat> who was given monarchical powers over the priests, monks, nuns, and to some extent even over the laymen. The borders of the kingdom of the Pope cross-cut ethnic and cultural boundaries. But there are other types of religious traditions. Staying in Europe, in Lutheran and in Orthodox territories, the organization of the clergy follows ethnic or state boundaries. In these cases, there is less conflict between church and nationalist movements, although the potential is always there. The role of religion uh, has declined in uh, European politics during the 20th century to the degree that many considered it to have become entirely irrelevant. Today, however, a number of factors contribute to its political significance. In Eastern Europe, after the collapse of the communist rule, there was a religious revival, often overlapping with the rise of nationalism. In the West, immigration helped to increase the role of religiosity in uh, two different ways. First, the immigrants tend to be more religious than the natives. And second, mass immigration made identity issues more salient. If you add uh, the focus of the mass media on conflicts between countries and ethnic groups with different religious traditions, Islamic fundamentalism, the security concerns related to terrorism and il illegal immigration, then you get a very dangerous cocktail in which religion is an important ingredient. In most European countries, the radical right-wing parties are the ones who are most likely to frame the enemy as religiously different. They are also often the first to include religious element in the national self-identification, but in this regard, the European landscape is actually mixed. You find different patterns in different countries. Ironically, religious people and churches tend not to support these parties, that is the uh, radical right-wing parties. In Central Europe, one finds countries such as Poland and Hungary, where there is a large authoritarian right-wing party that is typically not considered to be radical right-wing. These parties in Poland, these ruling parties in Poland and Hungary are religious both in terms of their rhetoric and in terms of their electorate. Then you have another different pattern in countries such as United States, where party politics is bipolar. There the conservative and the radical right agenda overlap and have a strong religious content. 
For example, abortion is framed as an attack on the sanctity of life. In most of Europe, moral issues such as an abortion or, or rights of sexual minorities play a somewhat smaller role and religious references are less common in the political discourse. More interestingly, often conservative religious voices come not from the radical right, but from the center right. In France, for example, opposition against single sex marriage came primarily from the conservatives and not from the radical right. And actually some branches of the radical right consider themselves pagan and anti-Christian. The skinhead subculture, for example, tends to borrow from pre-Christian mythology and uh, tends to reject the teaching of the Christian churches. In general, the radical right tends to be against social elites and authorities, while the religious people tend to show respect towards them. So there are important differences between the two. Now, paradoxically, the focus on Islam as the principal enemy can have positive side effects as well. For example, the equality between men and women is a central idea in many radical right-wing movements because they think that this is something that differentiates European culture from Muslim culture. Interestingly, some conservative Christians are closer on this dimension to conservative Muslims than they are to the liberals, socialists, or even extreme right in their own country. But religious conservatives and radical right have certain common enemies. Muslim immigrants are one, but cosmopolitan li left liberals are another uh, common enemy. This is clearly so at the level of many voters. Now, some of the Christian democratic leaders, however, consider the populists as their main enemy. Therefore, there is a split within the Christian democratic alliances in Europe. This ideolo ideological struggle that takes place within Christian democracy is very important from the point of view of illiberalism another topic of this uh, uh, conference. If the Christian Democrats, who are basically the center-right uh, uh, block of European politics, will manage to isolate those who have a radical right-wing approach, then the European Union can become a force of liberal democracy. This is extremely important for the citizens inside of the Euro European Union but it is also important for the countries outside of it. The European Union can help the rule of law, human rights and tolerance in its neighborhood only if it is led by politicians who genuinely believe in these values and who consider as one of EU's mission to promote these principles. Now, discrimination against atheists discrimination against minority religions, excessive privileges given to the dominant church, or the identification of the entire nation with specific religions are, in my view, not compatible with liberal democracy. There are many conservative religious people who understand this, but if religious conservatism is merged with authoritarian nationalism, these fundamental principles are no longer regarded as self-evident. And in this case, we are all in trouble. Thank you very much. But uh, muted Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor and Eddie, for a very interesting opening uh, presentation, which gives uh, us a lot of food for thought and will be uh, I know, continued with um, the second presentation. Now I would like to give the floor to our local presenter, Miseka Chitanava, and she will be providing us with the, the um, 
analysis of the Georgian context, which is very much interesting for all of us. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, I'm muted. Uh, so good, good, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to welcome our uh, distinguished guests, and I would like to thank you for allowing me to participate in the uh, public discussion. I was uh, uh, listening to Professor Eniedi uh, with a, a great interest, and I took uh, note of some of the uh, uh, issues which I immediately tried to compare with the Georgian context. And the presentation of Professor Eniedi and also the Georgian example uh, make it so clear why uh, uh, these topics are so important when we talk about fire rights and fundamentalists and um, religious conservatives it's so important to always look at the local context and uh, when i try to compare georgia with uh, the other uh, countries from west europe or east europe and the situation in those countries and also the political context now i always see that still you need to have a separate discussion about georgia because of maybe it's post-soviet uh, history uh, uh, because of the different stage of development um, because of the fact that the party ideologies in Georgia are so unclear and the contours are never distinguished or uh, set. And I'll do my best to compare uh, them. So we, we call them like far right, some far nationalists. Sometimes we call them like violent, xenophobic. And so there are many different uh, terms and words, but these groups are very diverse. They are not homogeneous and I would like to speak about several different groups that are more active in the, the public in and uh, they uh, actually um, represent and uh, we will be talking about the uh, the dominant church the orthodox christian church of georgia they are their representatives uh, what are the cross-cutting narratives and uh, how they try to uh, make their narratives legitimate uh, by means of the, the church. Uh, the uh, Patriarchate of Georgia is a dominating church in, in Georgia. They have uh, a huge influence. Uh, they're very influential and whoever appears on the political arena, whoever decides to involve uh, in a, an activism immediately they try to have the support from the church and make themselves legitimate with the help of the church because it is an additional uh, power an additional influence so recently with uh, Nassina in both in the public and also in the virtual environment uh, the, uh, the uh, some violent groups they, uh, we have emerging violent groups for instance uh, for Georgian public, it would be more understandable. We're talking about Georgian March, so-called Georgian March. Uh, another uh, group is the representatives of a Primakov Foundation. So now, uh, and these groups are, are, are attacking human rights defenders. They are attacking the idea of um, uh, liberal democracy. And I will be talking about these groups because they are very active. And uh, the state nowadays doesn't really have a policy to how to overcome or how to suppress this violent um, uh, behavior. And to the contrary, the state is um, making a very good use of those groups for their own. And they, uh, the state never has a, an adequate legal response to their activities. So please remind me to slow down with my speech because it might be difficult to translate. So. One thing is to look at their narratives. Those populistic groups, and actually let's take one group, Georgian March. Um, uh, so they don't really have a very clear and explicit religious narrative, unlike the diff other groups, for instance, the Georgian idea, which is not very active nowadays, but like uh, as an as, as and um, uh, open pro-Russian uh, narrative. Uh, they talk about Russia as a um, Orthodox Christian, historic friend, and so on and so forth. But there are some religious symbols, of course, and the Georgian March is uh, using them, but they don't really have an explicit religious narrative. Uh, if we talk about um, the Western world, uh, uh, and their attitude towards the, um, the liberal democracies. They're skeptical. Oftentimes they talk about West as uh, something really uh, um, uh, 
pervert and um, promoting perversies, etc. Um, and they're, they're talking about the ethnic Georgians, if we merge with the Western world, that the Georgians will become minorities. And um, for instance, Georgia um, March um, um, resembles to some extent, uh, resembles the uh, European far radical um, uh, movements. So there, there, there are topics like um, um, migration crisis and all these reactionistic uh, movements, they are not really um, um, pertinent to Georgia. It is not the context for Georgia, but uh, they still decided to copy paste from the far uh, right, right, uh, far right uh, movements, and they uh, decided to occupy that open space, open niche. And who's the, the enemy? Anyone that is culturally different. It could be an ethnic minority, a religious minority, LGBTQ members, Islam. Yes, here we also see uh, like a Turkophobic. Uh, anti-Islamic, but oftentimes the Islam is uh, uh, the synonym of terrorism. And also we have a Jara region, which is the neighbor to, to, to Turkey, and Turkey is often depicted as the external enemy next to Russia. And also this multi multicultural environment that will uh, kill the Georgian culture and Georgia, uh, Georgian context. But these narratives, um, and they, they um, are not just uh, using it um, in words. They are also physical and they are violent. In a, a peaceful environment, they are attacking the citizens, other people. Now, now let's see what are the, the, the resemblance with the, the uh, Christian religious group narratives. So first thing is xenophobia, chauvinism, uh, again, the other culture, and we need to evict and expel uh, the uh, different cultures. In the um, Orthodox Christian uh, environment, it started back in 90s so the, and also beginning of the, uh, the 21st century, attacks on uh, you know, religious minorities. And now it continues with the LGBT, the same, because uh, Nowadays, we know they, they don't longer chase the other uh, witnesses of Jehovah and they're not hitting them with big crosses. But now this LGBTQ community is like a big image of the enemy that is used by the, the, the march, by Georgian march. And I can give you an example of a very recent period where you can see the junction, the linkage between them and they try to use themselves uh, to legitimize themselves. So Bolshevik leader, a writer uh, uh, and a revolutionary, Nariman Narimanov, this person, and his monument that stands in Kremokakli region of Georgia in Marneoli. And there was a big clash. It was one of the, uh, the bishops uh, made a very chauvinistic statement. <clears throat> and he actually proposed an ultimatum to the local governor now to remove the monument. Immediately, the Georgian March and all the radical groups started to support this uh, bishop's idea. And there was this big campaign organized by Georgian March and the Primakov Foundation. And we could see the wave becoming stronger, the wave of the xenophobic campaign against um, uh, the ethnic minority Azeri people living in that. And we were observing that everywhere, including the um, virtual environment, social media, and it was becoming stronger and stronger. And um, the xenophobic notes were also becoming stronger. And many, uh, were, they become subject of attacks. So it's interesting to, <clears throat> see uh, how they use the, uh, uh, besides religious symbols, also nationalist uh, symbols. So we can speak about one um, public figure, Ilya Javtavadze, the, uh, the father of liberalism and um, uh, uh, of all these ideas. So on the one hand, it is a symbol of, of it is chosen to, he's chosen to be the symbol of, of these radical groups, but on the other hand, uh, Ilya Javadze is also the symbol of religion because he was pronounced as a saint. And so the, uh, the Christian church and the patriarch is uh, like, you know, uh, is used by those uh, radical groups to look, uh, make their movement um, more legitimate, to legitimize themselves. So the uh, Orthodox Church and nationalism and their uh, relations. So I would like to present a small historic context to make it more clear. During the Russian Empire, the so, uh, autocephalistic movement,
from the liberation movement was matching the at that stage of forming Georgian nationalism. And Ilya Javadze was um, uh, talking about the Georgian Muslims living in Ajara region. And uh, well, he was talking about not the same language and not the same religion, but the same territory that may, makes us all the same. And, um, and we'll look at that context, at that background, uh, it is really uh, preposterous to look at the attempts of political legitimation by the Georgian march and using Ilya Javjavadze, this public figure, to legitimize themselves in order to gain more supporters. And so we have different researchers um, who are looking at these uh, issues. Uh, so uh, many of the researchers call it a religious nationalism. So ethnic Georgian immediately means uh, uh, Christian Orthodox, so ethno-nationalism, sometimes call it mytho-nationalism. Some, some say that it, it was born during the Soviet period and then it turned into a anti-imperial uh, uh, anti anti nationalism. Uh, another um, uh, creation we can talk about, it is the uh, Georgian messianistic narrative, and it is um, uh, about the, it is the, uh, the uh, studies about Georgian language. And there was another narrative uh, <clears throat> during, in the doomsday, Georgia, the, the whole world will be adjudicated in Georgian language. And so this, and there was a terminology uh, attached to it, like a uh, divine Georgia first, it was the Ilya the uh, second. The patriarch who mentioned it. And um, uh, the wording of the Christ is risen, uh, he added, Georgia has, has risen, this wording. So, Eurosceptical attitude and also the Western world, its attitude, what are the attitudes of the religious groups towards Western world? Again, fundamentalistic, anti Western uh, attitudes. They started back in the 90s among the religious people, uh, religious members, because <clears throat> Georgia left the um, uh, Global Council of Religions. And the, the, those groups, they have a very explicit manifested narratives, anti-human right narratives. And oftentimes we um, uh, have a question about the pro-Russian or anti-Russian about Georgian uh, March. So where do we see that? And where do we see that they try to legitimize themselves with the help of Georgian church? So there are many, many cross-cutting points. So I, I, I don't really have time to go to, you know, into the details, but for instance, you and Agamek Ali, the uh, uh, chair of the uh, church's educational center, he has two articles. In those articles, he tries to compare Russia and Europe, and he now uh, has all the, uh, the, the reasoning of why we should choose Russia, because of the fact that they are Orthodox Christians, because we are cultural those <clears throat> and um, we have other presenters and um, uh, we will uh, maybe have also questions about the far right uh, movements and maybe their relations with the Kremlin. Uh, it could be like direct financial transactions. So you can already uh, detect those financial direct transactions, but ideological linkage is very obvious. And also here in uh, Georgia, <clears throat> the relations are quite obvious oftentimes. Uh, thank you, Eka, for a very interesting overview. So thinking about these topics, analyzing these topics, it's, it's very important to engage in those exercises, especially for Georgia, the transitional democracy, um, because it's, uh, the, uh, the far right populism is a problem, for, not for Georgia only, and also for many other countries. And now I would like to now uh, give the floor to our uh, next speaker, Mr. Uh, Schwerer, and he will also have 10 minutes. And meantime, I would like to remind our audience that they can uh, post their questions and send their questions in the Q&A uh, window. Please, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Um, I have a short presentation, so hopefully I can share my screen and just try it. Yes, I think you should see it now. 
All right, if not, just tell me. <laughs> All right, so um, I will talk about the role of uh, religion for the Western European radical right. So we now move to uh, Western Europe and I present some empirical findings from uh, articles I recently published. So uh, starting with a theoretical frame, right? There is uh, the widespread assumption about the so-called uh, new rise of religion in politics regarding Western Europe. So it's not about the traditional religious secular cleavage um, between uh, secular liberal forces on the one side and religious, uh, uh, religious um, forces on the other, but it's more about uh, the upswing of the radical right and its discourses deriving from its nativist ideology, right? So nativism as the ideology or others call it ethnic nationalism, uh, creates native in and non-native outgroups. And non-native outgroups are perceived as a fundamental threat for the homogeneous nation state, for the homogeneous society, right? And the main argument here is that Ubaka, among others, are claiming that recently the radical right creates religiously framed in and outgroups um, and presents itself as defender of Christianity against the Muslim threat, right? So Christianity, as well as secularism, uh, became part of the native in-group, which uh, should be protected against Islam. Moreover, it is argued that especially since 9-11, uh, the terrorist attacks, Islam has become the main out-group and Christianity and secular principles threatened by Islam are uh, framed as native in-group, right? So 9-11 symbolizes the turning point for the Western European radical right. And this is why religion is on the rise again due to the rise of the radical right, which uh, spreads anti-Islam, pro-Christian and secular messages, right? So this is like a very short, um, the theoretical debate. So uh, what we did, um, we observed empirically how religious, religious dimensions in election manifestos of political parties uh, developed over time since the 1980s and uh, whether the radical right indeed uh, emphasizes religious discourses since the turn of the century. So I will present some findings from our recent paper, actually published uh, this month in uh, Party Politics. And I will try to do that very short, uh, just some findings. So first, um, starting with the left figure, um, you see the net evaluation of Islam and radical right parties manifestos. So how they talk about Islam. Uh, over the, the different time periods, right? You see the, the parties under observation, five different countries and the radical right parties um, inside of this, this party system. And what is, gets very clear that um, like uh, the arguments from literature can rather be confirmed after the turn of the century, Islam became a very uh, salient non-native outgroup, right? You see the, the negative evaluation uh, on the y-axis kind of high values, um, and it's kind of a linear trend, right? So since 2007, 2010, since this, this time unit, um, the radical right engages uh, in anti-Islam messages. And you see on the, on the right side, um, kind of same figure regarding uh, messages towards Christianity, how Christianity is evaluated. This is the more ambiguous picture. So it's not a clear linear trend, but what you see is, that Christianity is mostly or only evaluated positively after 9-11, right? So even though there is no clear linear trend, um, the radical right sometimes refers to Christianity as a, as a positively framed in-group uh, belonging to the nation, right? So it's, it's not as clear as regarding anti-Islam messages, but at least we can say that after 9-11, uh, it was not framed in a positive way with some exceptions. So um, this is in and out group framing, um, but what about secularism? So uh, literature suggests that uh, secular principles are emphasized by the radical right in order to uh, exclude Islam, which is not compatible with secular values in Europe and secular principles. And you see on the left that this is true. Like, uh, I mean, after the turn of the century, um, all radical right parties, um, at least in one of their election manifestos, emphasize secular principles and secular values, right? Before the turn of the century, no issue at all. I mean, the, the values are very low, meaning that they hardly refer to this issue. 
in their election manifestos. And very interestingly, and this is also uh, in line with the um, assumptions from the literature, you see on the right um, scatter plots uh, with a statistically significant correlation between anti-Islam and pro-secular messages. So what does it mean? Um, it simply means that uh, pro-secular discourses, those in favor of secularism, only occur in those manifestos which also reject Islam, right? So they are kind of linked together. Secular messages cannot stand on, on their own. They are always linked to anti-Islam messages. The same is true, by the way, also for uh, pro-Christian discourses. So uh, references to the Christian in-group are also mostly accompanied by references to Muslim outgroups, right? So this is um, kind, of, kind of interesting finding. And moreover, the same is also true. I didn't mention that here. Uh, we also measured um, discourses uh, regarding uh, freedom of religion, right? The, the principle of freedom of religion and religious diversity, how this is evaluated. And we see here kind of the same correlation that um, rejections of uh, freedom of religion are always accompanied by anti-Islam messages. And this is um, why we uh, built this figure here. Um, meaning that all of these religiously framed discourses, right, in-group constructions, pro-secular messages, pro-Christianity messages, but also anti-religious freedom discourses, they all derive from anti-Islam messages, right? So this suggests that all of these religious discourses are used in a strategic way. It's not the, the core identity of the radical right. It's kind of a strategic choice of, of in-groups um, uh, constructed in order to strengthen uh, an identity, right, against, against Islam. But, and this is kind of interesting, you also see a new kind of logic developing in a, in a different and paradoxical directions. So you see that anti-Islam messages directly produce discourses in favor of secularism, but indirectly by a tour of pro-Christianity messages, it also produces anti-secular standpoints, right? For example, when uh, some radical right parties claim that uh, or demand that uh, the Christian cross should be present in public buildings, for example, something that is not in line with the secular understanding, right? Or uh, demands for a Catholic school, a mandatory Catholic school education, right? So these are some kind of paradoxical developments uh, which we found here and which we coded as anti-secular messages. And the last figure, and then I conclude, uh, this is uh, more about the implications. So you see here in this figure that also the quite mainstream, right, mostly conservative and Christian democratic parties, since 2015, 2018, since the so-called refugee crisis, also emphasize on anti-Islam messages, right? This is the gray line um, uh, within the negative uh, part of the figure. Um, so mostly they reject fundamentalist and um, terrorist Islam, right? Something we would all agree on actually. But there are also some parties like the Austrian center-right party and the French center-right party, which reject Islam as religion. Right? And this is something we see very problematic uh, and as illiberal. And um, we think we should observe that um, more. And uh, we argue that this might indicate some kind of contagion effect, right? The, the, the mainstream center right might adopt discourses from their radical editors in order to uh, draw away voters from their, well, voters away from the far right, right? So this might be a, a strategic choice. All right, um, a short conclusion. Um, I mean, I couldn't show here all of our uh, findings, but maybe some, uh, some findings that fit into this uh, uh, topic. So it is true, like we mainly confirm or mostly confirm the assumptions from literature that uh, especially between 2007 and 2018, so recently, the radical right is engaged in anti-Islam, pro-Christian, and pro-secular messages, not immediately after 9-11, uh, but some years afterwards. But we should also note that uh, anti-Islam discourses are much more widespread than pro-Christian and secular messages. Right? They 
are not that widespread as we saw like in the, in the scores of the figures that um, more important communicative strategy excluding Islam than praising Christianity. Nevertheless, uh, we argue that um, while the traditional conflict between church and state lost salience, so uh, we didn't found uh, references or few references um, regarding this cleavage, uh, we experienced the evolution of a new religious cleavage originating from the exclusion of Muslims. So again, all the religiously framed discourses from radical right parties are linked to anti-Islam discourses, okay? And last in this uh, uh, regards, or refers to, to uh, the implications, we also find some indications for contagion effects also, the center-right increasingly refers to Islam in a negative way since 2015. And again, we think that this is um, problematic for, for liberal democracy, at least, right? Because um, we argue that as long as such discourses, such illiberal discourses remain on the fringe of the political spectrum, um, they might not be such influential, right? Um, but if they are adopted by the mainstream, by, by ex accepted parties, like parties uh, stigmatized, um, they might also uh, affect public opinion and attitudes, right? So we think that this is um, something we should uh, care about. All right, uh, thank you very much. I'm done. Thank you, uh, Jakob. Thanks for a very interesting analysis. Uh, and it was very interesting because it was um, all discussed in view from the, uh, the party policy uh, perspective and it is interesting both from the uh, uh, Western European context and also context. Now we can move to a QA and a uh, session. Uh, uh, as far as I know, uh, there are several questions already and uh, before I uh, we read the questions, I would like to ask uh, Jakob a question. So you mentioned traditional um, right-wing like uh, Christian Democrats since 2015 they um, start using um, all these anti-Islamic sentiments right they are they becoming stronger in that and we also know that these parties so if we look listen to their rhetorics and if we listen to their leaders they say that uh, we are forced to lean uh, towards right because if we don't do that uh, then it may um, the you know, far right populism even stronger and the influence uh, in public even stronger. And that is why those uh, leaders, they say that we have to move towards right side to reduce their maneuver. So do you subscribe to that? And can it be a successful maneuver? Because in the other uh, paper, uh, you also suggest that uh, it could be a big concern for the uh, liberal democratic uh, uh, principles. Now we read out some of the questions that came in. Um, so when the presentations were over, there were some more questions. Uh, and that, that is why now uh, first we will be, uh, uh, I will be asking the questions. Uh, in Georgian, and then I will read them in English. So first question goes to Ekajita Nava. And the question is, so uh, how would you assess the role of religious confessions of the North of Christian? And um, where can we find the, uh, the social economic reasons of uh, religious conservatism in Georgia? Uh, then a question to Jakob, and uh, it is about uh, the Western European conservatism and, and uh, also Christianity. Uh, uh, so uh, what, what do you think? Uh, the, uh, the, if um, uh, not supporting their own ideas, will the same uh, be the interest? I mean, supporting uh, pro-secularism. Uh, and um, there is another question uh, regarding threats in uh, also Christianity and radical rights. So what is the reason? 
So Western context, if, if the Western context was uh, stronger and anti-Islamic anti rhetoric was strong, well, will they, would they change the, um, uh, the environment? Now the same questions will be read out in English. Yeah. By uh, so the question um, addressed to Professor Anadim, there are arguably many factors at work in explaining the ups and downs of democratization in some of the post-Soviet states, so for instance, in Georgia, economic decline, lack of valid commitment, weak institutional setting, etc. In addition to these factors, do you think that Eastern Orthodox tradition is some, somehow less respective or uh, of pluralistic development than, uh, let's say, other religious traditions? So, as I the question to Professor Anyadi from uh, Gavi, uh, uh, then the uh, other question. Uh, uh, to uh, Jitanava, Eka Jitanava, how would you assess the role of the uh, religious conservatives as an Zen Orthodox Christianity in the context of Georgian nationalism and um, uh, Muslim minorities, Baptist Evangelist Church associated with the counter in Georgian conservative discourse and etc. So this was a question to uh, Eka Jitanava. Uh, then the next question uh, uh, came from Michael Cole. Uh, it's interesting, uh, so I don't know like who uh, this question is addressed, but like I will read and you will identify yourselves. Very interesting that Jakob suggests that the use of uh, Christianity is a conscious choice by Arabs uh, to construct a clear in group identity. I wonder to what extent the, my, my panelists think this uh, Christian identity can be said to be an uh, artificial construction to, uh, in the Georgian context. Uh, are Georgian marriage and uh, alliance of patriots of Georgia, or for example, using Christian symbol, uh, uh, symbol, symbology just to, to gain popularity or do they generally uh, subscribe to the principles promoted by Georgian Orthodox Church? So I think this question uh, could be answered by all panelists. Uh, then the next question comes from uh, Jekler Gronwald. To what extent is there any interaction between religiosity, traditionalist far-right parties in West Central Europe and, and group in uh, Georgia? Uh, there is a uh, surge of such parties in Europe, such as uh, in Netherlands, uh, sometimes with uh, intellectual uh, ties to Russians, sometimes not, uh, feeding their audience with anti uh, fanatist anti-liberal, anti-liberal ideas, sometimes even uh, spread-headed by educated young women. And the last question, which came in Q&A, is uh, from Nina Samkharadze uh, to Jakob. Hypothetically, is there any possibility for political parties to operate democratically with any religious doctrine uh, with no rejection beyond the signs of uh, radicalization? And have you met uh, such uh, precedents in your research process? Uh, and one more question just came, I will read and uh, you will see like, um, that will be the last one, and then we'll uh, give the word to the attendees. Uh, this question uh, comes from David Matsaberidze and to Professor Anyadi. Uh, Professor Anyadi pointed to the universalistic nature of religious, uh, religion and the uh, particularistic nature of nationalism. Uh, what about the uh, fusion of the two in terms of uh, re real politics, uh, the Orthodox Christianity bringing uh, Russia and Georgia and nationalism? Operating the two. Uh, so what uh, Mrs. Chitanova talked about in the Georgian context and uh, Dr. Jolt and yet in the e, uh, CEE context, actually right-wing parties instrumentalize both religion and nationalism. Could you please reflect on this uh, issue through the a real politic perspective, uh, narratively or uh, of policy alternatives across from um, uh, CE countries, uh, uh, vice versa, uh, vice versa uh, by Brussels, and in case of Georgia, um, uh, with, uh, with 
and between the West and the North or South in Russia. Question goes to Professor Professor Anedi, basically, and I think that that was the last question. Uh, there was some questions from uh, chat, but yeah, they copy pasted in uh, the Q and uh, format, and I think that was the last one. And uh, for the second round, I will ask them to raise their hands, and they can speak in the microphones. So thank you. Thank you, Salome. I guess there were a lot of questions, and um, let's do it this way. If possible, let's take two rounds for written questions, like short, brief answers, two rounds for the first uh, session of question Q&A, and Professor Enyed, you are the first to go. Thank you. Great, great questions. <clears throat> uh, it's very difficult to characterize entire religious traditions uh, with a few words because they are obviously very complex and uh, they change across time. So um, one should try to uh, avoid what is called in, in this field essentialism or uh, thinking that uh, there is a culturally predetermined outlook for all religions. Having said that, there are important characteristics uh, of particular religious traditions in particular point in time that have political uh, consequences. Now, when it comes to Eastern Orthodoxy, I think there are some attributes that could be potentially helpful. Uh, one of them is a relatively high degree of pragmatism. Um, traditionally, for example, uh, the uh, Catholic uh, tradition had much more um, precise uh, recommendations for everybody involved in the religion, how to behave at home in private life, how to behave in public life, what kind of politics to support and so on. And that constrained uh, uh, the democratic potential of Catholicism. You have less uh, of that in case of orthodoxy. But there are some negative features which unfortunately uh, uh, create a lot of uh, uh, difficulty now. And it's basically that orthodoxy feels um, threatened by a modern world that is dominated by Western Christianity. And orthodoxy, um, because of this fusion with, with national traditions, is much more likely to be inward looking being closed in its own uh, uh, national uh, tradition. And therefore, uh, uh, there is potential for uh, xenophobia, for, for suspicion against other traditions. Also, there is the issue that um, orthodoxy has less emphasis put on uh, ideological, uh, in intellectual debates so uh, the clergy is less trained in, in uh, navigating in this world of um, intellectual developments than in case of some other traditions. And, and that can be a problem in a modern world where you have to be well versed in, in various um, intellectual traditions. If I may then go to the next question that was addressed to me by David, that, because it's connected to the previous one. Uh, that was about uh, um, universalism and, and to what extent um, political actors promote particular projects in the world of uh, religion. Now, it happens so that uh, when we speak about orthodoxy, then as some of the uh, commentators pointed out uh, in this uh, discussion already, you also have to ask questions about how, let's say, Georgian tradition is related to the Russian tradition. And um, orthodoxy does have a civilizational uh, uh, um, interpretation that goes beyond national traditions. And that ties me to what Brubaker said, uh, Jakob uh, uh, referred to Brubaker that there is a tendency nowadays to think about religion in civilizational terms. And of course, you can think of orthodoxy as a civilization. 
In this case, you bring together, let's say, Georgians and Russians and uh, Serbians and Romanians and so on, but you close borders towards the West, towards Protestants, Catholics, and, uh, and of course, towards East uh, uh, Confucian tradition or, or, or Islam. Now, this is something that is clearly uh, promoted by some actors in um, Moscow because it, it fits into the uh, uh, foreign policy st strategy of, of Russia. Um, I don't see similar attempts coming from Brussels. That is, Brussels doesn't seem to think in these um, religiously defined civilizational terms. Um, in the past, that was different, but I think now this is not no longer a strategy um, that is followed by uh, Western uh, uh, Europe. You see, to some extent, similar attempts coming from United States, and that's very interesting. They don't come from the White House, but they come from uh, West, uh, from uh, American Protestant religions, which do try to have some kind of international uh, um, cooperation involving Protestants in Latin America, Protestants in uh, Africa, and many other parts of the world. This is a very interesting strategy, again, typically not promoted by the White House or the State Department, but of course it depends on who is sitting in the White House. And if there are religious fundamentalists sitting in important executive positions in the United States, then this Protestant strategy can become a um, state strategy there as well. Thanks. Thank you for a very interesting comment. Now we will listen to Eka. Ah, sorry. So thank you. Thanks for your questions. And I will start from the very uh, last question. Um, you know, some of uh, some of it was already covered uh, by Professor Iniedi. Um, you know, he talked about uh, orthodoxy, and I also remember Brubaker immediately, and uh, uh, he very um, you know, well you know, forms it. And uh, Jacob was also uh, discussing you know, so this civilizational factor that is used. Uh, also for anti-Islam um, messaging. Speaking about orthodoxy, yes, it is more inward looking, it is closed, anti-pluralistic, and, um, and Professor Enya did, uh, no, they were all discussed the factors causing all that. And also in Georgia and also in other countries, uh, pluralism and religious pluralism is often viewed as a threat, some form of threat. Because in Georgian context, it was historically linked to a uh, uh, continuous attacks, attempts to conquer, and uh, Georgian uh, 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 orthodoxy and Georgian people were always like in a sense defense, self-defensive mode. And that is why we have uh, also so prominent anti-Islamic and anti-Turkish uh, attitudes. And uh, unlike uh, in Europe and uh, the United States, pluralism is not viewed here in Georgia as something positive, but rather something threatful, of, uh, as a threat. And one of the reasons uh, is an educational system in the Western world and also in, in uh, Georgia. But despite of the fact that um, uh, Georgia is a secular state and uh, is mono-religious and monocultural. Uh, usually in the textbooks for schools, uh, uh, the, uh, the multicultural concept is uh, depicted as something, you know, uh, dangerous, as a as threat. But the way Georgian culture formed itself and developed in the context of all so many different cultures, the knowledge and uh, the, uh, the material is not present in the textbooks. So one of the problems is the educational system and the second uh, clergy, orthodox clergy back in 90s, uh, so this, uh, they had this strong messianistic and isolationistic um, narrative, so it, was, uh, it became very strong in the uh, uh, 
in the world of Georgian Orthodox Church, and that's why they closed down the boundaries uh, towards the West. And uh, the Orthodox Church uh, rejected the uh, Kamenic movement, left the, uh, the Global Council and also the uh, European Church Conference. It all happened in the 90s. And, um, and those who were against uh, Georgia leaving the, uh, the Council and the movement, um, they adjudicated those members of the Georgian uh, uh, Church and said that this is like a treason and and this is the time when anti-Western ideas uh, start to become stronger and they cut the ties with the Western world. But before, even during the Russian Empire, all those relations existed and the linkage existed. There was another question about the social economic factors, right? If I'm not mistaken. So uh, social economic reasons of conservatism. You know what? This topic is very uh, broad. So in Georgia, religious conservatism is um, uh, defined uh, less by uh, economic hardship. But if we look at Georgian patriarchy, how it strengthened in, back in the 80s and how they became the dominating religious institution. Of course, it uh, included some of the, uh, the religious and political issues. And also, if we need to look at the overall context of the 80s and 90s. Uh, there was the extreme poverty in the country. And uh, at the same time, the church was the institution that would give people some sort of feeling of stability and sustainability. and. Uh, um, sort of help people to cope with their poverty and even existential problems. But uh, religious conservative uh, caused by economic problems and people who belong to a specific uh, uh, class, they are more subscribed to those ideas. No, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't believe in that and there is no clear correlation. Actually, I'm, I myself was not involved with that research, but the Georgian Patriarchate is one of the um, richest organizations in Georgia. So it is not just a religious organization, it also is a political organization. They, have, uh, they receive money uh, from the state budget, uh, millions. They also have uh, a real estate, immovable property, and uh, they are depicted as one of the um, richest religious institutes. And people who see that, some, some um, should have this feeling of protesting. So whenever you see that the economic situation in the country, uh, and uh, also you try to compare that with the economic status of a, of a church, you should develop a protest inside of you. I might not be able to directly answer the question, but uh, I don't really uh, have researched that, and that's why I'm not really competent to answer it deeply. But there are other background reasons that uh, strengthen uh, the uh, religious conservatives, and um, mainly it is the, uh, the relations between the state, the religion in the secular state, and all the violation of those principles and violation of the proper relations, because the state is using uh, the, the church uh, to make itself legitimate, and the church uh, gets economic dividends out of it. So this is mutually beneficial for the state and for the uh, church, and in any, uh, this is why the, uh, the church uh, became stronger as a political organization. On the, on the other hand, uh, the church uh, always tries to protect its identity, pseudo-Georgian identity, and they always try to speak about the Western world, the human right, as a threat to Georgian identity, something that attacks our identity and culture. And um, Georgia moves towards liberal democracy. We share the, the values. And uh, so we have this ideological uh, struggle on the one hand. And on the other hand, this model of relation between the state and the, the religion is that, uh, that that's why the religious conservatives become stronger 
in Georgia. So thank you, Eka. So these are the issues that need to be researched more thoroughly in Georgia because uh, there are more questions than answers. And, uh, and it's not the job of the um, think tanks or the research groups or scholar groups. I guess uh, a bigger institution such as universities should also get involved and uh, look at those uh, issues and try to analyze them. Now the floor is yours, Jacob. Yeah, thank you uh, so much also for this uh, interesting questions. Um, I think the first one was about uh, the strategy of the, of the center right, right? Um, um, becoming more close to the radical right in terms of uh, issues, policies, or discourses. Um, so if this is a necessary move, um, I think uh, we should distinguish two different uh, things in this respect. First, um, I think there are kind of uh, ambiguous findings, right? Sometimes such a more uh, an emphasis on anti-outgroup messages might uh, help the center-right mainstream to to gather some voters from from the fringe, right, from the right and fringe. Um, in other cases, it, it doesn't work, right. We also have cases such as in Spain, where the where the Social Democratic Party in Spain, um, like. Uh, um, is focusing more on, on, on inclusion than on exclusion, right? And it gained uh, uh, a lot of votes uh, despite the fact that it did not criticize uh, non-native outgroups, right? We have the, the case, for example, in Denmark where the central left parties um, included some um, radical right discourses, I would say, right? And at least it did not harm the party. Others would say that it was the, the winning formula for the elections. But nevertheless, I think this is the one, one question, if it is successful or not. I think that it could be successful, but it also could like uh, lead to a loss of votes from the core constituency, core constituency like, like the more moderate voters, which are not in line, which are not, do not agree with these outgroup constructions, right? But nevertheless, it might be that in some cases, such a strategy moving closer to the radical right, um, becoming more anti-migration oriented, anti-Islam oriented, whatever might be um, helpful, whatever. But the second point here is that it is also a matter of, uh, in my opinion, um, the identity of the parties themselves, right? Um, so it, it might help in the short run to uh, gather some, some support for the party. But uh, the question, is also if these parties uh, see themselves more as uh, like vote seekers, right, uh, office seekers, or if also ideology or policy purity matters, right, if they have an identity that might be harmed by, by adopting these discourses, right. And this is one point I think uh, parties must ask themselves uh, if this is in line with, with the actual uh, core identity of the party, of, or if this is, well, changes the party in, 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 in terms of identity, right? And the other thing that I mentioned in the presentation, um, they should also consider the long-term consequences. We know from empirical research that discourses, uh, populist but also nativist discourses, have an impact on public opinion and public attitudes within the society. And this is a, um, a consequence or might be a consequence of such communicative shifts of the center right, which harm liberal democracy in the long or in the middle run, right? And this is something I think, this is um, at least in my opinion, um, the strongest argument against uh, becoming discursively close to the radical right, right? Because uh, it, it might uh, produce attitudes or strengthen attitudes uh, within society because these discourses become more acceptable of the mainstream parties are leading them. Okay, so I think this is um, my opinion, right? Uh, it might be success successful in some cases, but um, I think that in terms of uh, democratic uh, quality, it might be um, rather harmful. Also regarding the outgroups themselves, which are object of uh, discrimination. Right? Um, so this, uh, regarding the first uh, question. Second, um, 
was about whether such religious references to, to religiously framed in-groups might also appear in other contexts than in uh, creating an in-group in order to exclude some others, right? Uh, yes, um, I think, of course, it's possible. And I also found some uh, example sentences during, I mean, I, we published now, or at least I published now, uh, three papers about these, these issue case study, um, comparative paper and the longitudinal one. And there are um, so many uh, examples of different um, contexts. For example, what I would say that, especially in Germany, um, references to Christianity or Christian values are still uh, traceable within manifestos or also on Facebook posts. We also analyze Facebook posts, for example, of uh, the Christian Democratic Union, right? They argue that our politics are based on Christian principles. And this is not, uh, this is their, according to them, their party identity, right? And this is not necessarily linked to outdoor constructions. Um, but there are also other examples like, um, recently, some left-wing parties, or uh, others would call them far-left parties, such as Die Linke in Germany, the left party in Germany, referred uh, to Pope Francis, for example, in order to uh, um, promote solidarity with refugees, for example, right? So they, they interpret Christian principles differently than the radical right. And I think this is the main point here, that um, religious principles, especially Christian principles, can be interpreted in, in many and different ways, right? And this makes these uh, references, uh, I mean, this is why, why political parties from different political angles are using them. Um, but nevertheless, I think this is important to note that all of these references to, to, to Christianity do hardly occur. I mean, we found them on Facebook, we found them in election manifestos, but to a very, very low degree, okay? So uh, they are no very salient communicative features. This is not the dominant, dominant discourse of parties, right? Compared to anti-Islam messages among the radical right, they are, uh, the percentage of the, these discourses are much lower, right? So we shouldn't overemphasize them. Right? We argued in our latest paper. So uh, it's true that they appear, uh, increasingly more often in the last years, but nevertheless, they are still um, not a dominant type of discourse. Thank you. Do I have some more questions? So we have 10 more minutes to go and we have two questions. So Nino Basalishvili uh, is raising the hand and also Dato Matsabaritza will use the microphone to, to ask the question. Uh, I guess the second person canceled this question. Dato Matsabaridze was the second to ask the question, but I guess he, in a Q&A, he texted that he's, he doesn't have a question anymore. So, yeah, I guess his question was already answered. Let's do uh, in a different uh, sequence now. Uh, Jakob will start, the NECA, and uh, Professor NEID will finish our uh, today's session. Please, Jakob. Okay, so regarding the, 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 the latest question, right? Um, I mean, I, I, actually, I, I, I didn't analyze uh, parties and movements in, in, in Eastern Europe, so uh, I might, I mean, I think there are 
there are others uh, more uh, concerned with this with this uh, discourses in these countries, but I could imagine so from my like um, anecdotal evidence that I have um, that of course um, Islam is an issue also in other countries, such as in Hungary, for example. Right, this is a, uh, used as a threat for the native uh, society and. This also leads to in-group constructions. I think, like this is my, my my impression, right? This is not based on empirical findings, but I think that Islam is a relevant outgroup also uh, in in parts of Eastern Europe. Um, but this might lead to the construction of different reframed in-groups, for example. So maybe um, in some parts, Orthodox Church or um, well other kind of, of of groups, which according to the far right. Uh, belong to the to the native society. It, it is interesting what you uh, what you mentioned, Jacob. If we if we look at lit literature, also Western European authors, they stick to Western Europe, and also the Central and Eastern European uh, scholars they uh, stick to their own region. And it's very rare when you see the comparative analysis, think tanks or work groups. So I guess it's about time to uh, achieve some thin synthesis. Uh, but there are, of course, um, uh, differences, uh, but uh, there are um, cross-cutting points, which could be quite interesting for the general public and also for the other groups of scholars as well. Uh, yes, exactly. I was thinking about the same, that it would be so good to have a comparative analysis or, or comparative study of you know, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, also like post-Soviet country like Georgia. And I was thinking about that even before uh, we came together in this session. Um, those groups that are active in uh, Western Europe, also right. Um, like far right with a very clear and explicit anti-Islamic narrative. So what they use as the, um, the arguments, why they are fighting against that. They say that our culture, our Christian civilization uh, recognizes the, the women and men are equal unlike this, so they, they have this dichotomic comparison. So uh, equality of men and women. So oftentimes, they also protect the um, uh, members of the LGBTQ community, saying that Islam is less tolerant towards these ideas. So these, these are the arguments that they use against them. And they say that Christian civilization is more progressive, and uh, Islam is uh, anti-liberal and intolerant towards these ideas. In Georgia, in Georgian context, it's not the same. It's totally different. Ultra-right groups or xenophobic groups, they, um, they stand against both against Islam as a different religion, I mean, doc doctrinal opposition to Islam. There is a, in the context, we also see a turcophobic uh, attitude. And they also see a political threat in Turkey, but not because uh, of these gender equality concerns or LGBTQ uh, concerns. No, to the contrary. This is a, a shared threat to them. I mean, this multi multicultural uh, environment, human rights based organizations, activists, liberal values, this is all this common threat to, to both groups. They are opposing all of that together. Everything that endangers Georgian identity, the way they say. So, and so this is the, why it's so different here in Georgia. And these are the grounds for uh, animosity and antagonism. In, in Georgian context, uh, these anti-Islamic attitudes are supported by so many different things, including the uh, educational system. If you look at in the school textbooks, Islam is always associated as, as a, a conquering country, attacking Georgia. Uh, and, but there is no discussion about the cultural representation of Islam in Georgia, or what is the contribution that we had from Islam. Religion is always associated by a conquering country, 
uh, a conquering tribe that was coming and attacking and killing the Russians. And uh, then also in media, in a social environment, in academia, nobody's discussing that. And that is why it stays as it is, a religion equals to danger. And that's how they are trying to represent it. Professor Eniedi, and please, you know, like just to summarize and close our event. Yes, thank you. So um, we have been discussing this shift towards a civilizationist discourse on the radical right among nationalists. Now this shift has happened in Central Europe even more spectacularly than it happened in the Western part of the continent. Um, 10 years ago, uh, nationalism in Eastern Europe was very different from the Western uh, nationalism. Nations were uh, mainly concerned with each other. There was this particularly a strong conflict, for example, between Slovaks and Hungarians. Many Hungarian nationalists uh, denied the existence of Slovakia for existence. Uh, denied the right to, uh, to existence. That is, uh, they said that Slovakia used to be part of Hungary and, and therefore, again, it should be uh, so. Now, there is nobody talking about the Slovak-Hungarian conflicts. The Hungarian nationalists and the Slovak nationalists are good friends because they are all fighting uh, Islam and, and uh, the immigrants in general. So there was a huge spectacular uh, shift, at least at the level of political elite. Now, how uh, robust this change uh, will be, we don't know, because this alliance between nationalists of these small nations in uh, Central Europe exists only until they have a common enemy. And once attention will shift elsewhere and they will not uh, face, uh, at least in their imagination, a threat from uh, uh, Islamic uh, world, they will stop speaking about the danger coming from the cosmopolitan Western uh, circles, then they probably will rediscover the uh, conflicts that existed in the past between Serbians, Hungarians, Slovaks, and so on, all these uh, nations in, in, in the region. But at the moment, Indeed, they talk about our civilization, which is a Christian civilization against Islam. And it's a very, very new formula. Thank you so much. Our time has expired. We used a bit more time than we uh, were supposed to. We have more questions coming in. But uh, unfortunately, we are not able to answer all of those questions uh, today. I would like to thank everyone, the audience, the presenters, for a very interesting discussion. We also have an idea. And uh, Georgian Institute of Politics is now working on uh, different subject matters, like party policy, uh, democratization. Uh, and also, we are, uh, well, we're working on a policy level, also on the academic level. And we will be thinking about, and maybe we can uh, come up with an academic project uh, to look at um, the synthesis, uh, I mean, the party policy perspective of these religious and uh, populistic groups. And, and um, maybe we can also engage into the exercise of uh, comparing the Western uh, European country uh, and uh, maybe the post-Soviet Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, and uh, Central European countries. So at least we will um, uh, make an attempt and we will start thinking about it. So once again, thank you for a very interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.